Okay, well, hello to everyone who's just joined us. Glad you're with us for this third program in our series in which we want to make sense out of the world that we live in. And today's program deals with the subject very dear to the heart of everybody that I know, folks. Um, and that is, what is paradise like? What is heaven like? And more importantly, how do I get there? That's the thing that we want to know. So the ancient prophecies, um, program three is going to tell us about that. And uh, we think that you'll find this very exciting. I certainly have. Now, because everybody's interested in paradise or heaven, um, I want to talk about what people are saying about it. Um, something deep within us senses that this life is not as good as it should be or it could be. Um, and that instinct is correct, folks. And tonight we look at the description the ancient prophets give us of paradise, or as some prefer to call it, heaven. What happened was a random group of people were asked what they thought about heaven. Well, here's a young man, a random, a random group, this time teenagers, and uh, this is what he said, heaven, man, that's pie in the sky out there somewhere. Unreal man, I can't fathom it. I can't say it with the accent that he'd be using. But that was really interesting. His comment, a, a middle-aged woman doing the shopping was asked the same question, what she thought of heaven. And she says, heaven is a state of mind. It's an inner peace, state of calm. Well, I'm sure it includes that. A very successful businessman was asked what he thought of heaven. And he said, oh man, heaven is my house. It's worth 3 million. My chariot is my Jaguar. The angels are my kids and so on. And I'm thinking, right. That's interesting. Here's another one like that. This one said, heaven is my roles and my house and my family. And I did wonder if the man feeding his family on $2 a day would agree with that being a really good picture of heaven. Nonetheless, moving on. A college student was asked about what he thought of heaven. And he said, heaven is, um, um, and he hesitated. Are you so out of touch? You still believe in those fairy tales? So people. An older couple, they were asked if they, what they thought of heaven. And they said, we hope heaven is real. The older that we get, the more we long for, the, for heaven. I can tune right into that. So question is, is there really a heaven? Is there an afterlife that's a lot better than what we have here and now? Um, well, after this program, I hope you'll be in no doubt about that. Now, when we deal into the ancient prophets, I'm focusing on the great ancient prophets from, um, from the Hebrew background. Um, they've recorded theirs, as you know, uh, on parchment, which became part of the, the Christian Bible and the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible. Um, the, Jew, the, uh, the Egyptians, of course, they put their prophecies, if you like, on their tombs and on stone. But here we have it in a book form. So I'm going to appeal to those particular prophecies tonight. Um, because I find those to be so helpful. Um, the, the great prophets of the scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, they talked about a new heavens and a new earth a lot. And we're going to see that tonight. Um, they talked about a world with, with clean air, clean water, free from sorrow and pain, free from war and crime and violence, a world filled with love and joy and peace. And so we're going to look at that tonight. And I hope it encourages you. Um, first of all, there were certain, um, certain great prophets of old who had some very interesting things to tell us. And they said, these all died in faith. Talking about people, ancient, ancient prophets of faith. These died in faith. We'll go down the, the, the screen here. Not having received the promises. And we're going to look at those promises tonight. But having seen them afar off by faith, were assured of them, embraced them, confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And they went on to say, those who say such things declare plainly they seek a homeland, that is, a heavenly country. Now, the reason I'm showing you this particular statement, this prophecy, is that it illustrates for us that heaven is a real place. Paradise is a real place, a country it's called here. And we're going to talk more about that soon. Now, here's a man, a unique man, Moses. And uh, Moses was an amazing man, um, arguably one of the greatest men in history. He's a man who had everything. He was the adopted grandson of Pharaoh, who had no other children. 
Um, when he became of age, with his Hebrew or Jewish background, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. And of course, he had everything that was offered. This is what he said. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, which he had access to. Or, and this is the word, these are the words that I want you to note. He looked to the reward. Folks, there is a reward for people who trust in God. And uh, I want you to tune right into that now. Forty years after that event, um, Moses was leading Israel into the promised land. And Moses' faith, it says, by faith he endured as seeing him who was invisible. See, what we need to know about these ancient prophets is that they were normal people, ordinary people, just like us. But God gave them an extraordinary experience. Um, but they had to deal with the same issues that we have to deal with in life. And they had to exercise faith just like we do. And Moses was one of those who just trusted God, that he was preparing a place for him. Now, he wasn't the only one. This is the Apostle Peter. Look what Peter actually wrote. We, according to his God's promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, we've already noted the fact that the scripture talks about a new heavens and a new earth. And uh, we'll see this coming through uh, uh, quite a few times tonight. That thing. Um, in our first program in this series, we noted the damage a worldwide flood had done to the structure of the earth. Do you remember that? Um, the earth needs to be remade. We need a new earth, and uh, it's called paradise, and we're going to note that. By the way, there is a difference between paradise and heaven. Heaven is where God's throne is, not that God needs a place to live. He's the eternal one, but he has a place called heaven where he relates to his created beings and where his throne is. Um, that there's also, and that's that's called heaven. There's another place we call it Earth. We happen to be living here now, and it's going to be a new Earth in eternity. All right, talking on. Now here's what um, here's what Peter had to say. He said that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must re receive until the times of note these words restoration of all things which has God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now note those words. The holy prophets since the world began have all talked about the restoration of all things. Now, things need restoring, as we've seen. The earth is showing signs of deterioration and needs all the help it can get. Um, it must be restored to the way God intended it to be in the very beginning. So those Old Testament prophets looked forward to God restoring everything to the Edenic beauty, the way things were when they first came from the hand of the Creator. Um, the earth was beautiful then, perfect beyond imagining people, and it's going to be restored back to the original condition, better even. So we're talking about a restoration to the way things were when God first made the world. It will be Eden restored, and that's why the Bible talks so much about a new heaven and a new earth, and Eden restored. Um, Eden was a spectacular home, folks, for our first parents, and it was to have been the model for the whole earth. Um, the whole earth was to become like this spectacular garden of Eden, and it would have been a beautiful earth, but of course there was an interruption, as we know. I want to think for a moment about what Eden was like. What was it like? Well, crystalline, clear lakes, pure air, bright sunshine, cloudless days. Folks, it would have been absolutely magnificent. Um, now, I'm a gardener. I love planting fruit trees. Those trees bore lush, delicious fruit. There were flowers that perfumed the air. The beauty was indescribable. All of nature was in harmony when God first made it. The birds and the animals didn't scatter in fear at the approach of humans like they do today. They flocked towards them. And animal lovers among us would have loved that, wouldn't they? So it was a beautiful place that God made. A pristine world he made for our first parents. Perfect, unspoiled, no problems, no unhappiness, no grief, no loss. 
no death. And God created two beautiful people to populate this beautiful planet. Now, I want to talk about that for a moment. Somebody said to me recently, you don't believe in that story about Adam and Eve, do you? So I asked them a question because they asked me one. So I said, look, is the population of the earth increasing or decreasing? <laughs> now, when I was a boy, folks, there were 5 million people living in Australia. There are 28 million now. 2,000 years ago, it's estimated there were 300 million people on the planet. 300 million. There were six, I'm sorry, 8 billion now. Now, you extrapolate back from that 3 billion and you keep going back. Eventually, how many people will you arrive at? You will have to arrive at two. And not only that, they have to live in the same neighborhood. That's worth thinking about, isn't it? All right, moving on. There was love, there was joy, there was companionship in that beautiful earth that God had made. And, and there never would have been anything bad except something happened. God had an enemy who came to spoil this beautiful world that he'd made. Now, next time we meet together, um, that will be the subject I'm dealing with. Why there is um, problems of evil and bad why there are wars and suffering and sickness. Why all is that all, is that all happening? We're dealing with that next week. And I think you're going to find it helpful. It'll be a big eye-opener. Anyhow, to get back to what we're looking at here on the screen now, um, this enemy came and tempted Eve and said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And of course, well, she said, yes, well, we're not to. And he said, ah, oh, don't you worry about that. Um, some people have thought, what a fuss about just a piece of fruit. Well, folks, it was a simple test and it was intended to be a simple way of establishing the loyalty of Adam and Eve to God. Um, taking what was not theirs because God had told them that's the only tree you can't touch. That fruit is mine, not to be touched. So taking what was not theirs, that was wrong to do. That was sin, folks. And uh, the tragedy of the earth has followed because it did something to the whole of the uh, mental psyche of Adam and Eve and of their progeny, who happens to be you and me. So humanity was lost or lost everything almost, not completely. Um, the, the, the sentence was given to them, the wages of sin is death. Because you've gone down this track, see, they had unwittingly involved themselves in the rebellion of Satan against God. The result was death. And we all know it's a reality every single one of us faces. Everybody who tuning in tonight, given enough time, we're all going to be pushing up daisies. That's the reality. No escaping it. Uh, we know it's true. So the wages of sin is death, but there's good news. They took hope with them because the other part of that statement of the great prophet is the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So God promised them, and by extension, us. He promised them a champion to redeem them. And that's where our hope lies. Well, when Adam and Eve went out of the garden, they multiplied in number and very quickly. And sin rapidly multiplied with it, unfortunately, until God knew he had to start again. And wickedness was just so rampant in the world and violence. God had to deal with it. And God sent a great flood that washed away the earth and made it clean again because the earth was filled with violence. Well, the earth started again. The world started again with Noah and his family. After the flood, sin unfortunately began to wreak havoc again. And once again, the earth is being filled with violence. And here we are all those years later. And we see all these things happening that we talked about in our first program, you may recall. And I'm just going to remind you of a few things. The tragedy of a child's life lost. One person, young or old, it doesn't matter. Unexpected terminal illness has its terrible impact on us. One world disaster follows another. This is the face of misery. Now, you're probably saying, hello, we've already done that. Um, why am I reminding you of all this stuff? this nasty stuff. Folks, I don't want you to fall in love with this world. 
I don't mean that you shouldn't make the most of this life and all its opportunities, but that we keep in mind that the few short years of this life are nothing compared to eternity. You know, people put massive amounts of time and effort into preparing for their comfortable retirement and they make no preparation for eternity. Does that make sense to you? It sure doesn't make sense to me. So Eden must and will be restored. And I want you to keep that in focus in your life on a daily basis. When things go that you don't like, that are unhappy, remember the best is yet to come. And we need to be there, folks. So Eden is going to be restored. Interestingly, heaven's focus is on this very thing. You look at the scripture. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's the race of life. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and notice what it says about him. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Now, most of us would be prepared, I'd say, to suffer for our children if we knew it would benefit them. And that's how Jesus saw it. He had a view to what his death was going to accomplish for the human family that he was a part of. And I'm going to explain more fully about that in a coming program. Um, but for this point in time, notice that he looked to the future. He could see his um, human family redeemed in paradise. And that was the joy that was set before him. So he put up with the cross for that reason. The half has never been told about what is God is preparing for his people uh, in paradise. And you may remember that a night ago we mentioned this scripture. I has not seen nor he heard neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. Remember I said on that first page, first night, first program, not in your wildest dreams have you come close to what God is preparing for you in paradise. And uh, it's true, when it comes to heaven, the half has never been told. So what will it be like, life in this new empire, this new world? Well, let's move on and find out. First of all, it's a place of eternal peace. The whole world is searching for peace, peace of heart, peace of mind, peace among men, peace amongst the animal kingdom. Well, this is time is coming. Look at that scripture. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within their borders. Folks, the nations are very restless today and it's very disturbing. It won't be that way in paradise. Oh no, dear friends, you've got a lot to look forward to. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the, says the prophet. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, this is the ancient prophet Isaiah who said that. And Isaiah had a lot to say about paradise, as we'll see in just a moment. Um, so there's no hurt, no destruction in this beautiful place. So you imagine a world like this. No crime, no more war. No one at each other's throat. No crime. No one taking from anybody else. No locked doors. No abuse, dear friends. None at all like that. Eternal health. The inhabitant, Isaiah says, will not say, I am sick. This means that doctors are out of a job. No hospitals, no pain, no pills. I'm glad of all this, aren't you? There'll be no sickness. Our kids won't suffer from illness. Not only that, there'll be no blindness. Isaiah went on to say, the eyes of the blind shall be open. He went on, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. No deafness. As I get older, I'm not as sharp as my hearing, and some of you will find it the same way. It's quite a nuisance, folks. It's a handicap. To be able to, to be completely deaf would be just very, very difficult indeed. Suffering, disability, a thing of the past. Look what Isaiah said. The lame shall leap like a deer. You know, this little kid, you know, it's kids like that jumping out of their wheelchairs. That's going to be a new world. No disabilities at all. I'd like to jump like that now. No speech impediments. I see, as I said, the tongue of the dumb will sing. Imagine praising God for the first time and saying thank you. And then look at this. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Um, no feeble people there, no tottering senior citizens there, 
what a wonderful time it's going to be. They shall run, the prophet went on, and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Sometimes you do get tired here, don't you, and feel lack of energy, weary, working too hard. God is going to give you an injection of divine energy on that great day. And uh, the tree of life, you're going to have access to that. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. That's going to restore your personal strength. Energy will flow through our bodies, folks, and uh, it's going to be something to be there. This is one that intrigues me. What will we look like? Now, this is what the prophet said. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we really belong, from which also we eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body. That's the one you've got now. Because it may be conformed to his glorious body, and that's the body he had after his resurrection, according to the working whereby he's able to subdue all things to himself. Now, this is an amazing promise, and this is... Um, an encouragement to us. Our bodies are going to be changed like his glorious body. Now, what kind of body is a glorious body? The one that he had after his resurrection. This is it. He had a glorious, resurrected, immortal body. Uh, that is, it was not subject to death and decay. And that's the kind of body that we're going to have, dear friends. Now, there were a number of experiences Jesus had after his resurrection that reveal that he had, while he had a, a glorified, immortal body, um, it was still very real and very recognisable. Um, after his resurrection, um, he met up with Mary in the garden where his tomb was, where he'd been laid for three days. And Mary was so overcome, she clung to his feet. And he said, don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my father. And he said, I'm going to ascend to my God and your God. Um, a vast difference. I mean, heaven is the place he's talking about, and it's a real place somewhere out there, people. We don't know exactly where. And that's where he went. Then the same day he came back in the evening and came and stood in the midst. Now, what's it, where's, where, where is the midst that, that's being referred to here? The disciples were in the upper room where they'd had the last supper with Jesus. The doors were locked. And it specifically says, for fear of the Jews, because they thought they would be the next ones on a cross. Suddenly, Jesus was there with them. Inside the locked doors, windows, everything. Um, and they, were, they thought they'd seen a ghost. He said, no, it's really me. Come and touch me. Hold me. Um, not only that, he took some food. He said, have you got any food? And they gave him some food. And he ate it in front of them to show them that he was really there. So it's a real person but it's just got a body much better than the one we have, folks. So we're going to have one bodies like Christ had. And remember, he's the model human being. What he experienced, we will experience. That's his plan. What about aging and death? Well, you're going to have eternal life. Better than that, immortal life. Immortal means not subject to death and decay. You're just not subject to it. Um, when God created humanity, he never intended anybody should die and grow old and decay. That was never God's plan. That was a result of sin. So not surprisingly, when things are restored, remember we talked about that a moment ago about the restoration, when God is going to return the earth and the people on it to the way things were at the beginning. And this is what the scripture says. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. No more grief, you see. No more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be nothing to cry about. There'll be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When the restoration takes place, that is the way it's going to be. Now, it's hard for us to imagine that, because we've never experienced that. Um, each of us has our, our fill of troubles and worries. Um, there'll be none like that. You know, Every funeral we attend, every piece of bad news you ever had fills our hearts with longing for something better. And it's the coming of the promised one. That's our hope, folks. And whether people believe it or not, are ready for it or not, want it or not, Jesus is coming. 
ready or not, he's coming. Um, personally, I'm only just so happy that we've got this amazing promise. Otherwise, what hope would you have? Now, I want to point something out that's very important here. There are hundreds of ancient prophecies which have already been fulfilled with 100% accuracy. You got me, didn't you? 100% accuracy, no mistakes. Those same prophets said that Jesus is coming back again. So we can count on the fact that this prophecy about Jesus' return will come to pass just as accurately as all the others. In a prominent a coming program, I'm going to show you some of the 300 ancient prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his lifetime. Um, just to give you an example, did you know that the prophet said hundreds and hundreds of years before he was born that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would grow up in Nazareth, that he would be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver, the number of, a number of pieces of silver, that he would be put to death on a cross. And in the prophecies of Daniel, an amazing prophet, the day of his death was prophesied in advance, some 500 years before it happened. Now, I'll put it to you, folks. We can count on these prophecies. They have been so accurate in the past, we know we can count on them in the future. All right, we're moving on now. More of the ancient prophet Isaiah. He says, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. When the new earth is established, folks, there'll be no deserts with their waste space. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Eternal beauty. In fact, there'll be beauty such as we have never seen it. It will be so wonderful and magnificent. The beauty of Eden will be restored. Just like the Garden of Eden, the ground and the hills carpeted, carpeted rather with living green. The scenery is going to be fantastic there. Now, I love the mountains and I love the scenery of the mountains, I love walking in the mountains. Um, going to see that is beautiful now. Imagine what it'll be like then. The beauty will be unimaginable. The flowers and the trees will perfume the air with life-giving fragrance. And imagine opening your eyes, dear friends, to this new great world. Breathing in the air that's God's air and drinking the water fresh from the fountain of life. Imagine eating the fruit from the tree of life. And imagine living in an atmosphere of God's incredible love. That's what we're looking forward to. Look at these flowers, aren't they magnificent, folks? But a faint reflection, however, of the beauty God is preparing for his children. And uh, you just look at those purples and the reds and the, the blues and the yellows and the whites and the pinks. It's just so marvelous. Um, God is making these things with you in mind. Folks, he knows what you like. And he's got a place for you on the new earth just the way you like it, with your name on it. He knows you. He knows exactly where you live and he knows what you love. Then there's this. A brand new planet and out of it will burst life just as the Garden of Eden once did. And uh, the tree of life will bear an abundance of fruit and it will be a real earth, a solid earth, but a new earth. And uh, that's why it's called in the New Testament the blessed hope, something solid to hang on to, something that won't crumple, crumble under our feet. Um, this hope inspires our hearts and lifts our vision. And I want you to keep this in your mind, people. It's so good to look forward to. The book of Revelation says, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. And uh, this represents, of course, the life of God that satisfies every need. It's a real it's a real river, don't make a mistake. And uh, we're going to enjoy it and be there. And in the middle of the street, the scripture says, on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits. Now it's either side of the river, so it's got a trunk on either side of the river and apparently meets the top and it's got this massive amount of fruit and how beautiful it is. Um, and it bears a fruit every month. Now, for a person who's a, a gardener like me, um, folks, that's sensational. I can hardly wait. And uh, we can sample that fruit and it maintains life forever. I don't care where people search, folks. There's something, there's an element in our diet that we cannot get anywhere else. And that's why we age and die. And it comes from this tree. It's as simple as that. 
And it goes on to say the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And they will restore us human beings to the stature and the, the way we were first made, the human race. So it's all behind us now, and we can look forward to that. Here are the words of a modern prophet. I love these words. That's why I included them here. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. That's what's being held out to you and me, dear friends. So one day, Jesus is going to come back and you and I are going to our permanent home, home where we belong, home where we sense our hearts will never roam and we'll be with God forever and all our loved ones. No sickness, no suffering, no death throughout all eternity. We'll be with our friends forever, our loved ones forever. And we're going to see Jesus face to face and you'll have a chance to say thank you for what he's done for you. Um, heaven is a wonderful place of fellowshipping and uh, this one who gave his life for you is the one who's made it all possible and that's what we're going to behold dear friends well what are we going to do there I don't know about you but I don't like doing nothing in fact I find that probably a very hard thing to do you're not going to do nothing in eternity it says, they shall build houses and inhabit them. Good old Isaiah again. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Um, you're going to have lots of things to do. Things that perhaps you never had the ability to do here, the resources to do here, will all be there for you to do in that wonderful new earth that Isaiah is talking about here. So heaven's a real place, all right, where we do real things, real activities. And uh, it's not a make-believe world. I mentioned in a past program, do not think in terms of disembodied spirits floating about on clouds playing harps. No, real people doing real things, just the way God intended it to be in the beginning. If it hadn't been that history was derailed by the entrance of sin, folks, um, we wouldn't have to have a restoration. We'd have just gone on from there, but we do need a restoration. It's going to happen, and you can look forward to that. As the days of a tree, so the days of my people shall be. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Wow, I'm looking forward to that. Well, what about fellowship and friends? Well, anybody who you love here and you know and care for here, you will be able to know and love there. Remember, this is a real place with real people doing real things. You're not somebody else in paradise. The real you, without sin, without all the defects, without all the disabilities, without all the restrictions, that person is going to be there. In fact, one of the greatest joys of heaven will be fellowshipping with our friends and loved ones. You think about that. Um, heaven would be boring if you didn't have someone to share your home with. And that's exactly the way God sees it. How will we recognize one another there? Well, I'm going to put it to you that these, all these things that are mentioned in the scripture our unique mannerisms, everybody, you can recognize people's walk and talk and so on, voice intonations, individual personalities. We're all different people. Um, you're going to be the real you there with all those things still recognizable, just without the taint of sin or disease or disability, as I mentioned. So your friends are going to recognize you even by your physical appearance. Uh, I'll put it to you, you're going to look a lot better than you do now. No wrinkles, folks. And uh, no disabilities, as we've mentioned many times. Yep, you'll be recognizable, all right? Just the new improved version of you in your full magnificence and beauty. God's going to give you a glorious, immortal body. God wants to save you, not someone else, the real you. You're the one that he loves now, and you're the one he's going to love then. Um, you know, it'd be strange if Christ paid the infinite price that he did to die for you and then totally changed you into somebody else. It's you that he loves and wants there. So your uniqueness is very important to him. Um, when Jesus appeared to his disciples 
in the upper room that I told you about a while back, they recognized him immediately. His physical form was still recognizable, even though it was glorified. Um, and I'm glad that that's the way it's going to be. Um, on the resurrection morning, Jesus came out of the tomb. Mary, one of his disciples, had come to see him and to anoint his body and embalm his body. And she was just outside the tomb weeping, and she couldn't see anything for the fact that she was weeping. And, and Jesus stood in front of her, and she thought he was the gardener through her tears. And then he said, Mary, called her name. And she immediately knew it was him because she recognized his voice. On that same resurrection morning, Jesus walked with two dis his disciples on the way to Emmaus, about 10 kilometers from Jerusalem. And the Bible says that they were kept from recognizing him. So they're walking along together, talking about what had happened and the death of Jesus before. He didn't want them to recognize him just yet because he had a, a lesson to teach them about trusting what the prophets had to say. So while they were walking along, he talked about some of the prophecies of the ancient prophets who talked about him and their hearts began to burn within them as they went along. They met together. They invited him in for an evening meal and he broke the bread in front of them and blessed it. And in the way he did that, they recognized him right away and jumped to their feet and he disappeared. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? They just knew it was him by the things that he did. There's going to be eternal joy in paradise. Come to Zion with singing with everlasting joy in thy heads. And note this, they shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Joy is such an elusive state of mind for many people, but not then. Folks, your life is going to be full of joy. Someone said, um, is that a good idea? That's a really good idea, folks. I can hardly wait. We're also going to have time to spend with God. And this is an interesting promise, Isaiah, once again. It shall come to pass from one Sabbath to another. All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. God promises to focus on the human family an entire day of every week. And that's not going to be boring, folks. That's going to be so exciting. The things he will tell us. Imagine it. All right, now I want to talk for a moment about just exactly where we're talking about. Remember I mentioned a little while back, um, there is actually a distinction in the scripture between the new earth, which is on this earth, and heaven, which is where the throne of God is. And uh, I want to just make that quite clear. When, we, when Jesus comes back for his people, we actually do go to heaven where God's throne is for a time. I want you to look at this. This is the promise that Jesus made while he was still on the earth with his disciples. Let not your heart be so troubled. He said, don't be worried about these things I've been talking to you about. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. And note that, the Father's house are many mansions. Um, some translations put rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. My Father's house is what Jesus said he was going to do. And he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There's the promise from his own lips. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, the Father's house is where he's taking us. Where is the Father's house? Well, do you remember Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer? And he said, it started off like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, using the old language. language, Our Father, who is in heaven. That's where he is, folks. That planet heaven, if you like. Um, so that's where... He's going to, Jesus is going to take us when he comes back. This is what's going to happen. He will come from heaven to the earth to take his heaven. And when he comes back, most people are going to be in their graves, folks. So when he still comes. Notice what the prophet says is going to happen. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The resurrection Folks, you're not already in heaven. You're in the grave. The dead in Christ rise at his second coming. How exciting is that? Then we who are alive and remain, because obviously the last generation of, of believers and people are still alive. So 
that group meets that group that's been resurrected and we shall be caught up together with them, the resurrected ones, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Not on the ground. Note that. I tell you, this is going to be a supernatural act. So when Jesus comes, dear friends, he calls forth his people from their dusty beds and out of the graves they come, their thousands and their millions, and they meet with him in the air from all around the world they come. And I tell you what, the most exciting place to be on that great morning is going to be a cemetery because that's where they're going to come from. The graves are going to burst open and out they're going to come. The biggest event ever to happen in the history of our world is coming soon. This is the hope of every funeral. This is the inspiration to keep yourself going, folks. When things look bleak around you, the dead are going to rise, rise to life again. And if we're still alive, we are going to join them. This is what Jesus said in what is called the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Folks, you have an inheritance in the new earth when it's been made beautiful again. <clears throat> now, I understand that an artist can only do their best with what they've got. And that's a fairly meagre representation of what it's going to be like, we know. But this is still pretty good. And I tell you, folks, it's going to be the best when we get to be there. Um, so here's what I want you to catch out of tonight's talk. Um, we are going to go to heaven for a time to be with God. Yeah, Jesus made that clear, and we all read the promise together here. And we're going to go to heaven. But the earth is to be our eternal home. Remember, there's a restoration of the way things were in the beginning. This earth will be made into paradise, and it'll be a new earth. And then we'll all come to enjoy it together. So God's original plan in creating this masterpiece of a planet will finally be realized. But we do have that period of time in heaven, a very important period of time, because you'll have a lot of questions that you'll want to ask God and Jesus. And that's what it's for. It's a time of amazing debriefing. And uh, the mysterious things that happened in your life will all be made plain when you see them from God's perspective. And uh, so that time period, by the way, that we spend in heaven um, is discussed in Revelation chapter 20, the whole chapter of Revelation chapter 20 deals with it, and I'm going to spend a whole program unpacking that chapter for you in a later time. Everything humanity needs is brought here. Now, this is amazing looking um, object is actually the New Jerusalem because the Bible describes it as being a massive cube. It's square and cube. I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a dime for her husband, a bride adored for her husband. Remember, I mentioned the fact that um, that we are that Jesus has gone to prepare mansions or rooms. It's in this new Jerusalem that that's where He's preparing the mansions for us, and it's magnificent beyond words, folks. This is what the, the Book of Revelation says about it. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. You won't need to take um, gold with you to heaven, folks. Um, the streets are paved with gold. It's amazing, isn't it? The 12 gates into the city are 12 massive pearls. Wouldn't it be fantastic to see? And uh, this little world that God redeemed becomes the center of the universe. God will be here and be with us. I want you to notice this scripture. It says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. And I think a privilege that God is offering us, that he will have us there in his presence. The scripture goes on in Revelation. They shall see his face. His name shall be in their foreheads. Folks, there will be no indefinable longings. You know what the great longing of the human heart is? It's usually unrecognizable, often unrecognizable by people. It's a longing for God. We were made to be united in heart, mind and soul with our creator. And to be without that, dear friends, leaves us 
missing something very big and we can't tell what it is until we come into his presence and find that it's him that we needed all along. We have a wonderful fellowship with Jesus and with God. Very, very close. There shall be no, by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. Only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There'll be nothing for you to fear in paradise. Nothing. Now I'm going to make a recommendation to you for the suggestion. I'd like to suggest that you tell him you want you get to give your life into his hands and he will write your name in the book of life. Note the scripture, God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. He who has the son has life. Folks, the book of life is where you want your name. You don't have to say anything fancy. Many years ago, I felt the call to give my life into the hands of God. And I simply said this, Father in heaven, I want to give my life to you. That's all I said. Added a few words, but that was, the, that was the gist of it. And my life changed for the better from that day on. I've never looked back. I encourage you, if you've never done that, to do it tonight. Jesus made a simple request, a call to show our loyalty to him. Remember, remember this is where Eve fell off the path of life by her disloyalty. A simple obedience shows our loyalty to him, and he's encouraging us. If you keep my commandments, he says, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my father's commandments. Folks, trust and obey. That's an old song. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Keep following him where he leads you, and you can't go wrong. Folks, we have an eternity to win, and we have everything to lose if we don't take it. Remember this. Those who have the Son, they get everything. Think about that. We get everything. I love this beautiful statement. I will come again, Jesus' own words, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Remember the scripture. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I want you to let this thought, folks, give you such peace and happiness that your spirit is filled with hope no matter, what, no matter what is happening in your life right now. Focus on this and you'll be able to live life to its fullest now as well as have hope for the future. I'm going to close now and I'd like to invite you to bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the amazing revelations that you've given us through the prophets of what you are planning for your people. We know that ultimately... We'll be here on this beautiful planet, made new, made into paradise. And we're so looking forward to that great day when Jesus will come and take us there. And Lord, for those who want to be there, and I know that you're touching the hearts of all of us, we just want you to remember our names, please. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, next, next program, folks, we are going to deal with this very important subject. There's a mega story in scripture that most people don't know. And it's really the, the original Star Wars, which might sound strange, but it's very, very important. Um, what we're going to do, folks, is unveil the origin of evil and wrong, lies, deception, cruelty, wars. We're going to, we're going to unmask that. And uh, this mega story was going to explain what's really happening in the world to you much more clearly. And you'll have all of those contradictions, dear friends, put away. You'll understand where we're going. So please join us next time as we examine Scripture's mega story. <laughs>